The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. Let me say good morning to everyone and welcome Special Envoy John Kerry to today's committee hearing. Mr. Secretary? Uh, I, of course, I raised, I, I have always raised uh, the issue of human rights. Uh, in every conversation I ever had as secretary, anywhere I was, we raised that issue. Uh, yeah, but I'm just about to get to it. And this trip with the Chinese officials, not the climate folks, because the climate, me, me, the climate uh, emissary for China, Xia Zhenhua, has been their special envoy on climate for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, we could casually talk about it, but he doesn't have any input or capacity to do anything on it. But I've raised it at the highest level with officials in China. And um, they deny certain things that we allege, obviously, uh, and move on. Uh, it's, a, it's a wall of, so, you know, different attitude about <laughs> what, um, uh, what they're willing to acknowledge and not acknowledge. Uh, clearly, we have a very different perception of what's happening, for instance, in Xinjiang than they are willing to acknowledge. So a decision has to be made, whether by Congress or the administration, how we will respond to that. Now, you have legislation, Ranking Member McCall, and maybe that's the way it's going to be responded to. I'm not, that's not my lane. My lane is very specifically to try to get the Chinese to move to do what we need to do with respect to climate itself. China is already the leading producer in the world of solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and lithium ion batteries. They produce 72% of all the solar panels globally in 2019. That's up from the last year when they were at 67%. US companies only produce uh, you know, a very minor amount compared to that. So, uh, Do you believe that they will honor their word on this issue I, it, of climate? As I said earlier, it's don't trust and verify. Isn't it true that part of the challenge you face with India and China is the attitude we can't afford to be clean uh, and that that is one of the reasons both of those countries will continue to peak up in CO2 emissions while the United States has been dropping for more than a decade? I would say to you, sir, with, with all respect, that it's, it's, uh, there is an attitude, but that's not it. The attitude is we're less developed countries, and we have to still develop. And according to the original Paris standard, there is a thing called common but differentiated responsibility. So we have a I, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Uh, Secretary, and I think you're exactly right. There's two different ways to say the same thing. We're not developed enough. We're not rich enough. But at the end of the day, they believe they have a right to continue producing more CO2 in order to catch up with our economies. They do. Well, we, we do it down. So uh, domestically for a moment, isn't it true that we're going to have to find ways to reduce our carbon footprint while, in fact, not putting ourselves at a competitive disadvantage to our uh, competitors around the world who are using lower cost energy, lower currently than most renewables. Yes. So if we're to do that, wouldn't the Biden administration have to continue a trajectory that began with the Bush administration and continued through the last two administrations, which is to convert from coal to natural gas, to increase efficiencies, to use all of the above, and to ladder our way down in the uh, consumption uh, production of, of CO2 rather than a draconian one. And I want to follow up with one quick question. You said, you quoted, I think, the LA Times, when you said that uh, California had 95% renewable at one point on one day. Uh, oddly enough, uh, my district uh, in Southern California has had repeated blackouts as a result of having not enough energy because on a hot afternoon, when the sun starts going down, we run out of power. So isn't all of the above and a, and a, a, a blended uh, solution what the United States should do while at the same time laddering down our CO2 emissions? Well, the, the key, I think, uh, Congressman, is to do it in a way that is integrated so that you can not have uh, any of those challenges. Now, this was one day, and I think they were pushing the curve to try to find out what happened. It's obviously not a long-term system. But the blackouts were many days. No, I get it. But, but that's why we need to have a smart approach that is integrated. But at the same time, 
gas is a challenge. The gentleman's time has expired. Back, maybe we'll have more time so we can follow up. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The gentleman's time has expired. The Biden administration seems to be copying the same climate rhetoric and policies as California. But California has some of the highest electricity prices in the country, is the largest importer of energy, and uh, rolling blackouts uh, are not uncommon. In fact, the state has been sued by civil rights groups for the impact of their climate policies on low income and communities of color. And to top it off, according to the Department of Energy, California performance since 2010 in reducing energy-related carbon emissions ranked 43rd among all states. What is your opinion of the California approach, and do you think it is a model for the rest of the country, sir? I think California has done an incredible job of pushing the curve of trying. 43rd, ranked 43rd in, this, in the country. In 43rd in what? <laughs> among all states in reducing energy-related carbon emissions. They're doing a great job. The gentle lady's time has expired. I'm for an mm. all of the above effort because we don't know which of the best of these technologies is yet going to work to do what we have to do. One last word. Even if we get to net zero by 2050, we are still going to have to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. A lot of people don't stop thinking that. We still need the technology that's going to enable us to do it. So I think there are great possibilities here for discovery. We're creating more jobs in this sector already in America. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there are already more people working in this new clean energy sector than there are working in fossil fuel or in many other sectors. General Lady's time has expired. I now acknowledge Rep Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you just quite literally contradicted yourself. You said you are for all of the above, but you're not. We spoke earlier, Representative Issa asked the question about the Keystone Pipeline. You're fundamentally in disagreement with delivering that fuel into the United States of America. It, it, it would beg the question, did the hack on the Colonial Pipeline save you the trouble of having to shut that one down? Well, uh, Congressman, uh, I appreciate your, your question. And may I, as a matter of personal privilege, just say how much I admire your personal service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, I uh, would say to you this. I don't think it's a contradiction. Yes, we're going to use gas for some period of time. And I'm not one of those that comes in and says, you got to shut it down today, tomorrow. We can't do that. What we can do is begin to take steps that reduce reliance even as we keep alive the ability to have sufficient gas for the purposes we need. It's a fair point, Mr. Secretary, but to the point that you made to my friend Mr. Issa, to quote it, that is true. The pipelines are more carbon delivery efficient than rails and trucks, Correct. saying they, they deliver the fuel by using less carbon in order to deliver that fuel. Let but me Congress finish the quote. Here, let me the finish challenge. the quote and I'll let you respond. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that, that you want to be adding another line, another one of these more efficient routes. There are alternatives, but yes, pipeline is better than trains and trucks. So let me, let me tell you why we, we can do better in meeting our goal of reducing our emissions. All the gas we burn, first of all, gas is 87 point some percent methane. Gas leaks. If you, in the, in the Permian Basin, for instance, we have a leakage, even if you have it around 2.7%, scientists say that can be more damaging than CO2. Our leakage is at about 5% or 10% in some places in, in America. Now, if that's the leakage in America, think what it is in other places. Because of the melting of permafrost and the melting of the tundra, the thawing of the tundra, we're now seeing methane being released around the world that isn't capped, that isn't used. President Biden has put an effort into his legislation to start capping open wells and open mines that are giving off methane in the United States. Mr. Secretary, could I summarize, well, your, could I summarize your position by saying you want no crude or petrol used? <clears throat> Would that be an accurate summary? The what? You want no crude, no petrol used in the future. Would that no. be an accurate summary? Well, it depends what you mean by the future. We're going to be doing that. We're going to be using crude. We're going to be using crude. We're going to, well, crude, first of all, is used 
for lots of other things than food, fuel, and power. So we're going to use crude well into the future. Not delivered by pipeline, though. Well, no, it could well be delivered by pipeline already. We're doing that. But our source of power, President Biden has already made this decision, and the utilities are already accepting it. I want to ask one more question because I, I want to yield some time to one of my friends here who, who may not be able to, to ask you some questions. By 2035, though, President Biden is determined we will be carbon free in our power production. You're talking about not allowing these new avenues to deliver them, even though they're more efficient, like the Keystone Pipeline. Would there also be an effort to not promote other forms of delivery, that is to say, not permit a new rail car that's being used to deliver that because Colonial is down right now, not permitting a new uh, truck to go over the road, uh, which is what's being used to deliver those, those fuels right now. Would that also be a part of the no, program? No, 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 I don't. I, I really think we're talking much more reasonably, Congressman, in a way that we have to try to accelerate the transition to clean fuel. That's what we have to try to accelerate. It's not going to happen overnight. So we're going to need, now I'd rather see gas used rather than coal anywhere in the world. And I think there are ways to try to assist in doing that. But even gas. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm going to yield my time to Mr. Pfluger for a moment. Okay. No, thank you for yielding. Mr. Secretary, for the first time in 70 years, our country is energy independent. It's a lever of power. It's national security. Energy security is national security. And so you've mentioned that we need to take steps. We have taken steps, as you've clearly highlighted today, from being 15% down to 11%. That's huge. Do you believe that wind and solar can provide baseload capacity for this country? Not alone. No, that's absolutely right. We Not saw it yet. in Texas, Not the winter yet. storms, and we've Not seen it in California. I should, I should amend that by saying, Congressman, not yet alone. If we break through on storage. Minimum time has expired. The answer is yes. One other thing I will say to you is, one of the new benefits of technology is that we have an ability through space and satellite tracking to now measure quite precisely what a particular company is doing or whether its food, its, its supply chain is, uh, is uh, behaving the way they promised. And we can look even at governments and whole countries and have almost real time readout on exactly what is happening with respect to their emissions. So the planet will have much greater transparency and accountability than it's ever had as a result of technology's assist here. Gentlemen, time all has we expired. Did, all Gentlemen, we did time has expired. Uh, but I want to close the record by saying that climate change is no longer a crisis on the horizon. It is an existential threat that will displace populations, imperil economies, fuel conflict, and forever change our planet. America cannot single-handedly overcome climate change alone, but we can, however, lead the international community into collective action. 